In this week's episode, I'm joined by Lisa Demi, she, her, who's DEI speaker, author, MC, and master egg poacher. This week, our conversation is about some equity for the WNBA, the new CEO at Japan Airlines, Kate Spade's focus on mental health awareness, and more. Hey there, my name is Bernadette Smith. Welcome to Five Things in 15 Minutes, my weekly show where I bring good vibes to DEI. That is good vibes to diversity, equity, and inclusion with a little dash of corporate social responsibility. What I've found is that there are lots of news stories about what's going wrong in the world and lots of negative data, but there are also a lot of things going right. That's what I like to focus on. I search for DEI stories that we can be inspired by and learn from. My hope is to inspire you to experiment with some of these inclusive actions and policies within your own organization to help you build a more inclusive world. Let's get started. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I, I love it. I love the, I love what you, you, you got me hook, line, and sinker the first time I saw your, your first show. Thank you. Thank you. I love doing this show. I have so much fun. I meet great folks like you and uh, you never know what you're going to get. So it's, <laughs> it's a good time. So Lisa, before we get into your work, can you tell me before I forget, what is your trick for making perfectly poached eggs? Oh. <laughs> Um, well, the trick is to use an egg poacher, but when I'm really, really poaching them, I use vinegar and I make a little whirlpool in my, in my water. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Got it. I haven't ever tried the vinegar trick. Does the vinegar keep it more like cohesive? I, you know, intact? my mom, my mom was like the, she was like the, the MacGyver of cooking. So whatever she told me to do, I didn't <laughs> ask a lot of questions. I just did it. So, so yeah. you can't tell me the science behind uh, success. Yeah, heck no. <laughs> heck no. <laughs> All right, Lisa. Well, let's get into this week's show. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your background and, and what you're up to? Sure. So I like to say I've been speaking since I was born. Um, I, I remember as a little girl loving to be on stage. I was in a band that played nationally for, I don't even know how many years anymore, um, had a marketing firm and spoke a lot in the marketing firm and decided, how can I make this into a living? Sold the firm, became a speaker, and I haven't looked back since. Um, love it. I love, I would do it for free if, you know, if there weren't those bills things that yeah. you have to pay because I just love sharing information and helping people. Awesome. And talk a little bit about this, the talks you do around DEI. What's sort of your, your take on it? You know, I, I feel like DEI at its core is kindness. Mm -hmm. um, and I realize that that's super simple, but I feel like I, I like to focus on kindness because I think it's something that everybody knows. Either they know how to be kind or they know when someone's not being kind to them. Mm -hmm. And I think kindness is just a real easy place to start with because it's not like you don't have to prepare for it. You can just be kind or, or not, I guess. Yeah, I agree. I talk about the power of kind curiosity in one of my talks. And I think it really does matter because hopefully it's something we've all been learned and I we've all been taught. And I think that kindness sort of also is a theme in basically every major world religion, right? Yeah. You know, sort of the concept of love thy neighbor and, and <laughs> just caring for other humans. Um, so yeah, I completely agree. I, I love that. You know, I talked a little bit when, in this week's five things newsletter, I wrote a little bit about how one of the questions that my clients keep asking me to talk about or sort of the reason people have been coming to me is to give others tools to connect with others. You know, the, the question is like, what's the solution to a culture when people are shutting down in, instead of opening up? And something that I'm really passionate about is helping folks get out of their lane. I just feel like we have 
gotten to this place in our society where we're very polarized and we're super in our bubbles and, mm -hmm. and we've normalized ridicule and shaming of others and shaming of other beliefs and shaming of other ways of being and ages and all of it. And it's just this, you know, judgmental energy that I just think is, is really terrible right now. And so my call to action uh, is play. And I think that's really what we need is to reconnect over play and just being together and laughter, you know, sort of those simple pleasures. Yeah, I totally agree. I use art a lot in my, uh, in my um, work and I find that it kind of takes people out of their head a little bit and it's not like a, you know, a corporate project that you have to do or, you know, I mean, remember when we were little kids and we used to finger paint all over things. And I, I just want people, like you said, to play and have fun again and not be so um, buttoned up, I guess. Yeah, I think we've gotten to this point where people are so afraid of saying the wrong thing and so yeah. afraid of um, being canceled or being ridiculed or being shamed. And so there's just this sense of disconnect and, and people shutting down, I think, especially in the workplace. We just sort of yeah. focus on our job. I, I agree with you. And, and rightfully so. I think people are nervous about that because, I mean, you could say A and half the people online will say B and attack you for it and call mm -hmm. you, you know, all kinds of things and have you questioning your own opinion. And so I think that, uh, yes, everything that you just said is the reason why people are having a hard time being themselves and, and, or like you said, getting out of their own bubble. I mean, we, we all want to wrap ourselves up in the bubble wrap anymore because we're afraid of getting attacked. We're afraid of being wrong. We're afraid of being ridiculed. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, after I wrote that, I went out and played some pickleball because that's <laughs> my thing is pickleball. And one of the things that I have really enjoyed about it is the diversity um, in that sport and the people that I've played with in open play just really check every box. You know, it's just really a beautiful thing. And so, um, you know, I just hope that folks continue to find opportunities to connect, whatever that looks like, mm -hmm. because I think we just, we really need it. We really, really need it. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that connection and, and talking to each other gives us a, a different perspective and expands our lens. Mm -hmm. And if you just stay inside your own little box, you're never going to know anything different about anything. Yep, exactly. All right, well, let's get into this week's five things. All right, the first story this week is about how the WNBA, that's the Women's National Basketball Association, players will now fully travel on charter flights instead of commercial so this is a monumental stride in player welfare and professional standards and a benefit that the NBA has enjoyed for decades. There are some players who've had some really big safety concerns, specifically Brittany Griner um, in airports. And, you know, it's tough for these, these athletes. If they're not getting a lot of sleep because of the whims of commercial airline. Yeah, you know, I think that was a really big thing that, you know, the WNBA is such a hot topic right now because of the Caitlin Clarks and and even to the Brittany Grinders and, and uh, you know, Angel Reese and all those guys. And I think it's awesome that it's such a hot topic. And I think that the WNBA making that step to say, hey, we're going to charter our players is a huge step forward because I think the inequality between the NBA and the WNBA is massive. And I, I know some people would say, well, the NBA funds the WNBA. I believe the WNBA funded this themselves, uh, being able to do the, the air travel. And so I think it's really, um, I, I think it, it, it's, it's important for two reasons. One, it talks about the fact that we're trying to even the, the playing field. But I think the reason that the WNBA was actually able to do it was because there is so much more attention coming now and people are starting to pay attention. They are starting to put their money where their mouth is. And we're now saying, oh, we want equal time. We want equal play. We want equal pay. We want equal, you know, accessories and goodies. Put your money where your mouth is. You know, yeah. I mean, how many of us signed up for the league pass? You know, I think, I think a million people signed up of my friends signed up for the league pass. So I, I'm really, 
I'm excited to see that because I think the taking care of the, the players is just as important, but also seeing like the community and people say, Hey, we're going to support women in sports. We're going to support, you know, the things that we want to make change in. You know, it's been a beautiful thing seeing all of the progress on uh, and more equity for women in sports over the past few years. So I, obviously there's so much more work to do, but um, I'm having a lot of fun celebrating <laughs> what's yeah, going on. Right. Yeah. Same. All right. The second story this week comes from the American Cancer Society, which just launched the largest ever study of black women who have historically not been well represented in medical research. So this Voices of Black Women study will track 100,000 black women over 30 years. They have lower breast cancer diagnosis rates than white women, but significantly higher mortality rates. So it's looking at the healthcare disparities and trying to tr identify the appropriate interventions so much bias in the system. Yeah. Uh, the, the first thing that struck me when I read that story was I was blown away by those figures. Yeah. Like, I mean, I've been around American Cancer Society for years. I used to be part of uh, the board here in Tampa and do the relays. And I knew all the information that a lot of people didn't know. And I'd like to think that I've kept on top of it. But the fact that we don't know that those statistics about Black women to me speaks volumes because well, have we been hiding that? Have we, you know, is it getting shoved under the noise of everything else that is going on? So I'm really happy to see that first of all, that the statistics are being shared. And second of all, that we are putting that effort and time and money into addressing that because that's that the, like the information we're going to gain from that study is going to be mind blowing. Um, you know, we still don't know everything about cancer. And now if we can even look at how cancer affects one demographic, even, I think that's going to give us a ton of insight into how to address not just cancer for black women, but cancer for everybody. Yeah, I think that there are a lot of factors in play. Um, a lot of systemic racism within the medical system, a lot of yeah. lack of black doctors as a result of that. Uh, misperceptions by white doctors about the mm -hmm. capacity of black women to endure pain. You know, there's just so much that's gone wrong that this study really offers an amazing opportunity, like you said, to, to learn so much about. I'm sure it's not just going to be revelatory for the cancer um, field, right? I'm sure it's going to uh, be. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Okay, the third story this week comes from Japan Airlines, which has a new CEO, Mitsuko Totori, and she is a woman. That is a really big deal because Japan is ranked near the bottom of the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index and is the worst ranked country in Asia. So this set a huge precedent to have her become CEO and she started as cabin crew. So that's another beautiful part of the story as well. I love this. Yeah. Pro I mean, props to Japanese airlines. I mean, mm -hmm. props to them for, for going out on the limb for that. I and mean, that's something that I think would be like an anomaly in the States, mm -hmm. much less in a country like them, where you said like they're at the bottom of that list there. I, I love that they said she's qualified. She can handle the job. She can do it. Oh, and oh, by the way, she doesn't ha come from the same background as some of the men who mm -hmm. have had that job before. Like she started, like you said, as a flight attendant. Mm -hmm. And I love, you know, it's that kind of that, it reminds me of when my parents were growing up and they're like, if you work hard and you keep pushing, you can attain everything. <laughs> and I, it, it's like, she said, all right, I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to be a flight attendant. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep learning and keep learning. And she just kept taking a step and a step and a step. And finally, these guys were like, holy cow, this person, this woman is the right person to, to run our company. Yeah. And she is, she seems like she has bitten that thing off and she's just, I, I loved it. I love hearing that. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, we just really need to see these precedents set because mm -hmm. someone has to go first, right? And boy, yeah, I mean, absolutely. it is, yeah, I can't even imagine the pressure she's under, but I love it. I love that. Yeah. 
there we are. Okay, the fourth story this week comes from Sesame Place in Philadelphia, which will offer low sensory days this June, especially for children with disabilities. So this means quieter dining, reduced audiovisual effects, really to be more inclusive of neurodivergent folks. Now, Sesame Place already was certified as the world's first mm-hmm. certified autism center and has trained staff a low sensory room and noise canceling headphones already available. So they're just taking it the extra mile. And I love this. I, I love that, that neurodivergence and, and, you know, maybe that also is a, a kind of a, a catchphrase, but I love that it's getting the attention that I think it's been missing. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when people typically think DEI, they think black, white, gay, straight, mm-hmm. uh, maybe religions, maybe genders. But I think neurodivergence still kind of is on the lower end of the scale there. Mm-hmm. And I love that Sesame Place said, hey, we're, we're going to up the ante and mm-hmm. we're going to even do more than we're already doing. Mm-hmm. And I, imagine as a kid, how awesome it must be for you to feel like there is a place for me. There is, a you know, I am special and I am seen and I am acknowledged. And for the parents who have those children, how much, like, how, it's a gift for everybody. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, of course. And if you know they're going to do well financially, <laughs> you know, it's just yeah. wins <laughs> all around, you know. And yeah. that's, I think, where there's so much opportunity in this work is to create wins for everyone because it's not a zero sum game, not at all. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Okay, last story this week comes from Kate Spade. So May is Mental Health Awareness Month and uh, Kate Spade, the designer, died by suicide in 2018. And afterwards, the brand really doubled down on mental health initiatives. This was pre-pandemic, including a partnership with Taraji P. Henson's foundation that addresses the mental health of black women and girls. So they've done a lot in the years since. Um, And I just want to shout them out for for really setting a precedent Mm -hmm. um, all of these years ahead of so many other companies, which still are not caring for their employees' mental health. Yeah, I mean, I think that I I I mean, I remember when when that happened, when Kate Spade um, committed suicide and being shocked. And I remember thinking, what's going to happen to this brand? Yeah. You know, of course, after wondering what happened to this person um, that made her feel that way. But I love that, like you said, Kate Spade has doubled down and they said, Hey, this is, this is real. This is important. This is something that we need to talk about. And maybe there's a stigma attached to it, but we don't care. And I think, They look at who their audience is and who their prospective buyers are. And I think that, you know, like you said, when you do this work, if you, I think if you make it more real for people and you talk about the things that are actually happening, then I think your, your buyers and your audience pays more attention and, and sees you more as like, maybe not so much of a brand, but now it's, there's a person attached to that brand. Yeah. And and I think they've com- continued to make it important. You know, I think they were saying, hey, not being OK is OK years yeah. ago. Yeah. And I feel like they kind of spearheaded a lot of what's happening with that now. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Folks, read that story. I'll put the link in the show notes. Make sure you read that story because it's really interesting. Some of the things that they've been up to and, and their true commitment to this. This week's call to action, uh, speaking of mental health awareness, I have done a lot personally in this realm to manage my own, my own stress, um, my own mental health in times of acute stress. And I have my own kind of little bag of tricks. Um, but there are some kind of physical tips that I learned uh, about regulating my system on, from someone on Facebook. So I'm going to share that link in the show notes as well, because I do think it's really helpful to think about non-traditional ways to manage our body and our health. Lisa, thank you so much for joining me on today's show. How can folks stay in touch with you? Um, Smoke signals and carrier pigeon. (laughs) Uh, I am all over social media. You can, of course, you can go to my website, Lisa Demi, D-E-M-M-I.com and find all my connections there. Um, But you can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, 
Twitter, I'm sorry, X, um, <laughs> uh, YouTube, uh, TikTok. I'll, I can make up some platforms at this point, but I'm, you can find me anywhere. And I love talking to all people about all the things. So please absolutely feel free to reach out. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. It has been really fun having you on the show. And folks, if you don't already get the five things newsletter, you can subscribe at five things, DEI.com. Have a great week. Thank you for listening to five things in 15 minutes. I hope you found yourself inspired by at least one of this week's stories. If you did, would you mind sharing it with a colleague and leaving us a review on your favorite podcasting platform? And if you don't already get my Five Things newsletter, join at fivethingsdei.com. I'm Bernadette Smith, and I'll see you next week right here for Five Things in 15 Minutes, bringing good vibes to DEI.